Hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Meg. And this is Gare Can Get It. This week, a woman hits on Gare and he doesn't like it. Like, I don't, I got nothing. Like, I need, I need your <laughs> This is good. No, I like it. I like it. Uh, the one time a woman propositions Gare and he's like, uh, you, no. <laughs> it's wrong. It's backwards. It goes against the laws of nature. <laughs> what? No, that's not good. <laughs> ah! It's like the fembots in Austin Powers when he uses his mojo and he breaks them. Yeah, that's that's the natural order of things. Yeah, See, but like reversed. my my the best that I came up with was this week two vampires in a speedboat versus an old woman with a razor. Who will win? Like it's nothing. It's nothing. It's no good. So <laughs> I like that one too. Uh, it's not. <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> I I made a easier version. If they gave awards for makeouts on screen or stage, this guy would get a lifetime achievement. He'll find any excuse to get right to second face. You honestly wouldn't believe it. Dissecting each and every kiss with tongue. There's only one conclusion to come to. It's that Gare can get it. Gare can get it. Fuck me. <laughs> this week, this week we are discussing... A TV movie from 1994. It's called Hush Little Baby. And in it, Gare plays Doctor, because he's always the love he's doctor. He's always a doctor. Dr. Yeah. Martin Nolan. Um, as you just said three seconds ago in a clip that's definitely going to be cut out of the final podcast, um, this is his second TV movie that we've watched, although the audience will not have heard our other episode because it is the forbidden episode that we need to <laughs> fix or redo or burn or something at some point. But- this is his second TV movie that we've watched from, was that, that one was from like 92? I feel like they're both like early 90s. Yeah, they're all like um, Forever Night era. Yeah. The other yeah. one is called um, Other Women's Children. As I said, it's the, for- the forbidden episode we could not get through. We're going to get through it at some point. I feel like um, we've watched other things where he's like anti-mom, where it's like, moms are great until they're not great. Really? What else have we... I'm looking it I up. I feel like right those now. are the only TV movies that we've watched. Well, he was in that episode of Littlest Hobo where he was um, inappropriately in love with his mother. <laughs> that was so weird. That was so <laughs> much. And like, I feel like the episode doesn't know that. But then you watch it from like a 2024 lens, and you're like, "Why are you holding your mommy's hand? Why are you why are you hugging her so tightly? Why are you calling her like she's a dog? Like like come here, mommy. Like come <laughs> mommy, here. I was come like, here, come inside, mommy. Yeah. They they ran through that baseball. Um, park with like holding hands and like skipping and shit i don't fucking i don't like it felt like a divya situation like it would have been it would have been less upsetting if they were just like straight up they got problems at home like it just it would have yeah cause, like now it's just like why why i are think you? the and, only like, other the only other published episode where it's a cautionary tale about mothers is the outer limits episode where the lady's mom gets young and then fucks in his bed <laughs> You know, I um I I tried to I tried to forget that but, but it's okay. I, I it's, it was for love. It's fine as long as it's for love. It's coming back to me. It's all coming back to me now. Yeah, cuz they specifically could not make an alien sex baby unless it was with someone that they loved and they had yep. to do it in Gare's sex divot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it had to be that was the best possible chance of getting no, impregnated. I mean, Look, I am not anti-science. Okay, I, it's fine. I get it. It's fine. No, outer limits knows it shit. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not arguing about that. I'm just saying it was like a cautionary tale about mothers because her mom was like, "I don't like you. I like your sister, and I'm going to show you that by getting young and then fucking your uncle in your bed." <laughs> Who hasn't been there? That's just a timeless tale, really. Anyways, <laughs> oh my god, hush little baby. I am having I can't even start. I can't even start talking about this movie because it's so much. Okay. So Gary plays Dr. Martin Nolan. He is the husband of the main character, and her name is Susan Nolan. Um, they are a blended family. So he's got his son, whose name is Dylan, who ding ding ding, characteristic number one, is played by Ilya Woloshin. And if you're like, huh, why do I know that name? That name sounds so familiar. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you why you know that name because he played Daniel, the cockney child vampire <laughs> in <the episode laughs> Forever Night. 
I just, I love it. I love that it all comes together. And, and like, Gare gets to be a daddy to Daniel finally. Like, I just, I'm like, good. I love it. Yeah. He, it feels like, it feels redemptive. Yeah. It does. It does. It feels like it's fixing that, that little plot hole where Daniel just, I guess, continues to exist as a Cockney child in London forever. <laughs> they, the you know, they just kicked him out. They were like, lesson learned. Have your, have a good time. Go out, avoid the sun, sharp sticks. Don't get your head cut off. See you in a hundred years. Can you imagine it's like London 2024 and you're walking around and there's a, a 1940s child vampire <laughs> dressed like a tiny soldier just like <laughs> hanging around Trafalgar Square and you're like, uh, hello. <laughs> hello, child with a very authentic Cockney accent. Okay. So we've got Gare and his thankfully no longer Cockney son, Dylan, who are from the first marriage. Um, and then we have baby Petey, who is the little little baby that um, Susan and Dr. Martin Nolan, he's like their, their new child from their new marriage. Um, and then we've got Susan's parents who have stupid names who are, they're there. Okay. They're Verna and Dewey. And those are her adoptive parents. And that's going to become important in about four seconds. And it's like, yeah. the, I forgot how much the 90s did not trust adoption as a concept. Like, no. like they were so suspicious of it. Just like, who would give up a baby? Is it a bad baby? Is it a bad mom? Like, there's like no, like, this was just the best choice for everyone. It's like, the, is the devil involved? Are there cults? Is there a crazy woman on drugs? All three. Like, it's got to be like something like evil and suspicious. And like, it, I don't know, it bums me out as like yeah. a core concept of this movie. But anyway, so there's uh, adoption. I know. It's, it's so, like, yeah. I mean, this was satanic panic era too, so. I mean that's true. It, but it it would have bummed me out less if they were like we're suspicious because there have been cults stealing babies in this town or something. Do you know what I mean? If there was like no, a just reason. like adoption is always shady. Why would you want somebody else's child if not for nefarious purposes? Yeah. So we've got our little blended family, and the very first scene, just like in other women's children, is a dream sequence because every one of these, every one of these like TV movies has to start with a creepy dream sequence. It where does. where Susan, children so, die. <laughs> right? Right? The 90s. I don't get them. I the love 90s them. is like, oh, I got the hook. I got the hook, y'all. Just, <laughs> we're going to put this at the beginning and no one's going to turn this movie off. Let's kill a child in the first five minutes. <laughs> it's going to be great. And that's exactly how they filmed it. <laughs> right? So, so, okay. So it starts off with a dream sequence where a child who is Susan, like it's her as a child, she is um, being put into a bathtub of scalding water by a woman who is singing hush little baby in the creepiest i'm just gonna say divya voice because that's that's the vibe that i get from her is full yes, on high pitch <laughs> <laughs> you doing divya voice is my favorite thing i just want to do this entire <laughs> podcast with you in full divya voice but no one would be able to listen to it because they'd have like nosebleeds and die and crash their cars and shit but okay so it starts off with her having this this dream and like whenever she describes it it sounds like I was a baby and my mother put me in the bathtub, but the child she's putting into the bathtub, fully clothed, is like 10. <laughs> is it big? <laughs> is a large, it is a large growing child <laughs> who I feel like should be able, like, I remember stuff when I was 10. I feel like if my mom nearly scalded me in a bathtub, I mean, maybe I would have like a full emotional blackout. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. But it feels sort of like, you don't, you don't remember like when you were 10, like what your mom looked like or anything. Nope. Just totally, totally yep, gone. Just gone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's her like it's played as a dream, but it's meant to be like a flashback to something that happened in her life. So she like wakes up um like sweaty and panicking and characteristic number I guess um Ilya showing up is characteristic number zero. So characteristic number one is Gare being like, A woman having a nightmare? Allow mm. me to comfort her. Like he's in the other out. room and he gets like Gare sense and he has to like <laughs> run in. <laughs> His dick. Oh my god, go, go. <laughs> where where boy? Show me boy. Go, go. <laughs> Man, you're not you're not in this scene. Actually, we can you can go to the craft services table. He's like, I am needed. <laughs> a human woman needs to be comforted, so he comes in. He doesn't. It's not as good. So, um, preview of the other women's children episode. In that episode, the woman wakes up from a nightmare. Gare is behind her, rolls over to her, and uh, basically sticks his dick in her butt. Because, yeah, you no, know, because she like reaches back to like pet it like a snake. So, <laughs> but like in this episode, unfortunately, he's not behind her, but he's in the other room and he comes in. And I, if I remember correctly, there's still like a lot of like Gare spidery fingers like on her shoulders, yeah. like the comforting, the comforting yeah. hands of Gare. <laughs> 
Okay. He has, yes, a, <laughs> he has a skill set. I I love it so much. So, um, oh, I forgot. I forgot. Obviously, the very best character. Uh, there's a girl named Meg, and Meg is supposed to be yes. um, a girl who is of the age when she should be thinking about starting university or like has just started. So I feel like 16, 17, 18, 19, maybe. She is clearly played by an actress in her early 30s. <laughs> she is it's like another i want to say characteristic but i feel like it's really just a characteristic of all 90s tv shows which is i need a 17 year old are there any 35 year olds available i feel like that's just yeah we have that in no. highlander yeah I think we have that in some other stuff where it's like hey that's, fellow that's youth, for a long like, time that's what we do and then only recently yeah. they're like what if we use 20 somethings like young 20s right yeah they're still they're still adults they can still legally like consent to stuff and you know be aware of what they're doing, but also yeah. they don't look, they don't have as much gray hair as I do in my 30s. And so they can conceivably play children. Like I just, I love Meg so much. They're like, she's kooky. I like the, I like the, we know Meg is out there, but she's so good with the children. Like I just love that line. <laughs> And the way that they just the way that they demonstrate that is they're like, what if she has short hair and like a patchwork jacket and two necklaces with crystals on them? What? So crazy and out there. And I was like, oh, the 90s. Your shorthand, chef's kiss. So beautiful. Yes. So um, we have Kooky Meg, and she is kind of there. I don't know if an au pair normally also is a housekeeper, but she's like half babysitter, half housekeeper. She like does a little bit of everything, but Gare is like, she doesn't yeah. iron my shirts right. And I'm like, well, you my friends who have an au pair she doesn't do any housework i i didn't think i kind of thought that they were different roles so maybe she's it's, a housekeeper plus it's usually in the contract like they might do light housework but they won't they're not gonna like scrub your sheets or shit they're just gonna do like i'll throw a load of laundry in this it felt like they expected her to be like a full-on housekeeper and also as an additional duty take care of PD all day long. So like, I don't, I don't know. She's housekeeper plus babysitter plus jack of all trades, which is her downfall. Anyways, Meg is cool and fun as Poor are Meg. all Megs. We know this. Poor Meg. Yes. I know. Yeah. Can so, confirm. Yeah. It's just, it's science. It's a fact. So, <laughs> okay. Science. So we have, we have our 34 year old teenage girl who lives in Gare's house. It's not weird. Don't worry about it. They all live in a beautiful, weird nineties mansion, which is in the woods on an Island that you need a ferry to get to. Cause you can't have a 90s melodrama unless you are physically isolated from everyone by a boat on an island. And I feel like, weren't they also on an island and other women's children? This is like, they're like yes. sequels to each other. This is so yeah. weird. No, there's a ah. ferry. Definitely. They have to take a ferry on and off the yeah, island. Yeah, right? I feel like I remember that. Why, do we, why did we set everything with fancy people in like not Seattle? I don't. So we've got um, the family living in their weird 90s like cubic sharp angle here's a wall of bricks for no reason fancy modern 90s mansion in the woods on an island far away from everyone else this is totally a smart decision definitely a good idea that they did it so yeah no it's fine so the movie starts out with um with susan having a nightmare of herself as a 10 year old child with her mother singing a creepy lullaby version of hush little baby scalding her in a bathtub and she remembers this sort of like she's like she describes it like she's a little baby when this happens, but the visual is definitely like a ten year old large child yeah, no, wearing she clothing. Should be able to remember this, right? I mean, I mean, maybe it's like a psychological blackout, but it, it also feels like how do you how do you only have memories of this in dreams? And you're she doesn't even seem to realize that they're memories. She's like, I keep having this weird nightmare of exactly me and a woman who I don't I don't know who that could be. Uh, trying to scald me alive at age 10. That's weird, right? Like, just, Well, her adoptive parents didn't tell her that her mother was alive. So no, she but doesn't... she knows she's adopted. That's the, that's the part that like, because I, I was at first I was like, okay, if she doesn't know she's adopted, she's just like, that's uh, just some random woman in a weird dream. You know you're adopted? I don't know. It's not this, she, it's just fine. like in other women's children, the main character in this is dumber than a sack of rocks and you, you will want to scream at her the entire time, as I think you yes. did when we watched this together. You were like, I did. <laughs> yes, no, I did. The entire yeah. time. Definitely. Okay. So, she, so she's having her her dream. She wakes up. Gare is in an entirely different room. He senses a woman in need, so he has to run in and like spider fingers all over her because that is how you comfort a human woman. That is just science. That's how that works. So mm -hmm. she is now comforted. We learn throughout the course of the movie that this shadow woman is actually a lady named Edie Landon, who is dun 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 susan's bio mom what because again the movie takes a really nuanced and uh helpful approach 
a thoughtful approach to adoption as, as I think. Yeah. Lizzie. No. Yeah, yeah. No. A very '90s yeah. approach. Yeah. 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 Which is anyone who gives up a baby must be crazy, and then the movie proceeds to just like prove its own point. Anyways. Yeah. So, um, the reason that we haven't seen Bio Mom or that Susan hasn't seen Bio Mom in 25 years is because Bio Mom was convicted of attempted murder and child endangerment and sent to the psych ward where she has been for 25 years. So again, this is like a guilty but mentally ill situation is is my guess. Because I think the movie definitely 100% did legal research before writing Oh, yeah. No, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. No. Yes. Yeah, so, so smart and thoughtful. Uh-huh. Quality, quality yeah. LexisNexis work. Okay. So Susan knows she's adopted. She's aware of that. But she thinks her bio mom is dead. She has no memories of her at all. So she, the movie starts out, she gets a weird phone call from just rando fat PI who is like the stereotype of every like sloppy PI. Like he, he's basically, he should be eating like a wet submarine sandwich while he talks to her and also smoking a cigarette and also like drinking beer at 8 a.m. Like that is, that is his whole vibe <laughs> that he gives off. It's just like, it's just like slob stereotype. <laughs> Um, and he's like, bring, bring, uh, your bio mom is trying to get a hold of you. And she's like, um, no, I think you're definitely wrong. Cause she's definitely dead. And he's like, nope. Uh, you like, she's definitely, she's alive and her name is Edie and I'm going to just tell her where you live and all of your contact info. I don't have any like obligations to anybody. Okay. Bye. And like hangs up. So he calls Edie and he's like, I talked to her and she's alive and I asked her no questions. So she's definitely your biological daughter. Um, here's her information. <laughs> Good luck with that. So even in this like three second conversation, so the movie does not want to be at all like coy or subtle. Like, I feel like if it were no. made today, they'd be like, they'd be like, oh, like this isn't this great that bio mom is now back in our lot in her life and we're going to have the best relationship and I'm going to grow to love her and she's going to grow to love me. And like, then it would be revealed that she's actually like cuckoo bananas. No. Yeah. No, they would bury the lead. They would a little. They'd give you like a little. They need to bury the lead. Anticipation. No, this way she buries an axe in people's backs. Like, yeah, no, that's that's the only subtly at all. Pretty much. Ever. Yeah. So the second the PI calls Edie and is like, "Hey, I think I found your biological daughter," for reasons, sure. Edie is like, "Tell me the address again." He's like, "I told you three times the address." And she's like, "Does she seem like she wants to love me forever?" And he's like, "I got other clients. <laughs> Goodbye." And I'm like, "Okay." Mm, yeah. I'm seeing I'm gonna circle some problems with this situation, but sure. <laughs> so um and then just to really like just to really gild that Lily, they have Edie go out into the hallway of her deteriorating crappy rundown apartment building and see a like a creepy lonely ghost child with a paddle ball and she breaks the shit out of this paddle ball. So you know she's evil because she's fucking with kids. Okay. Yeah. So again, this movie starts out very subtle and very smart. So um, Susan and Gare, they end up going to dinner at her at her adoptive parents' house at Verna and Dewey's house. And we noticed while watching this movie that I don't that I don't know if Gare like had lost a lot of weight before filming started, or if they had previously um they had previously hired like a much bigger actor. Like they had hired Dom DeLuise, and then Dom DeLuise was like, peace out now. And then they're like, Well, we could get Gare. They're definitely the same character type. We'll yeah, get it's Gare fine. to show up. But in we'll just give him Dom's old suits because they are so big and baggy on him, but also like so short. Like his suit, yeah. his suit jacket um, cuff like ends at like the like in the middle of his forearm for some reason. But it's wide enough that like he and Susan and also Dewey and also Verna could be wearing that suit together, and there would definitely be room for like a fart to pass between them. Like it's just it is such a weird. I don't get it. He either gets like the best quality clothing and you're just like, oh, they knew how to dress him. Or he gets like rags they found out of a gasoline soaked dumpster. And like, unfortunately yeah. for us and for him, this is a gasoline soaked dumpster movie. And I'm I'm real sorry. But so yeah. he's sitting there in his like weird clown suit at, <laughs> at dinner with Dewey and Verna. And Susan's like, um, so I got like, I got the, a phone call um, from this PI, and then um, Susan also gets a letter from Bio Mom because, like, twelve seconds after, I guess Bio Mom hangs up with the PI. She's like, "Dear Susan, I love you forever. Can I come <laughs> to your house?" Like, it's just, it's like, <laughs> and she's like, "There's no Hell way, yeah, you can." <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Susan, <laughs> I I love my mommy. 
Susan just goes like straight to like, oh, I, I didn't even know I had a mother until 12 seconds ago, but like you want to be my second mommy? Yeah. I, yeah, yeah I'm pretty it. sure we're best friends forever. Yeah, oh my yeah. God. I don't see any red flags. I don't have any reason to be cautious. Like, let's just do this shit. Do you want to get matching tattoos? Like, it's just, she goes from <laughs> zero to 300 so quickly. <laughs> Oh my God, no, this is, you were talking about mommy issues. This is Frankie Drake all over again. I thought I had dead oh, parents. Now I have live parents. No. In fact, it is exactly Frankie Drake. I thought I had two dead parents. And then we will find out in this movie, she has two, well, she briefly, for like a hot minute, she had two alive parents. <gasps> yeah, we've met once. I'm pretty sure you should meet my children and be alone with them. <laughs> yes. Live in my house. Touch Live my in baby. my house. Like, Hold my baby. I, you know what I just realized? I would very much like this movie to be remade with Maria Bamford playing all the parts. You know what I want? I want someone to do a fan edit of this movie where it has a laugh track. How could you possibly? Like, it's just so deeply uncomfortable. No, no, Except when no, we get to the It would make it scene. so good. Like the scene where he walks in and she's shaving the inside of her leg. Can't you hear the like, <laughs> <laughs> the like laugh track in the background? That would make it so creepy. That would make it even <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Uh, that is obviously my favorite scene in the movie. We will get there. I want to unfold okay, it like okay. a beautiful flower. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In our four hour long episode. But now, hopefully, you will always see it with a laugh track. Like a sitcom, a sitcom horrible fake laugh track. That would make it so eerie. That would be yes. so horrible. That's that no, I a better wow. movie. Wow, wow, you went straight. You went straight. The devil. Okay, <laughs> okay. I have gagged I cannot you. focus with this movie. It is this movie is so much. Okay, so Susan um, gets the call from the PI that's like, "Hey, you have a mommy," and she's like, "No, I don't." And then she gets a letter um, going. Dear Susan, I'm your mommy. And she's like, oh, my God, you definitely are. So then Susan and Gare in his giant clown Dom DeLuise suit, they go to Susan's parents, Verna and Dewey's house for dinner. And she's like, hey, um, Verna and Dewey, how come you guys never told me that uh, my bio mom was alive? And in fact, you told me the literal exact opposite. You told me that she died. And they were like, well... We just thought it was easier than telling you. It would have been hard for us to tell you. And we didn't want to have a hard conversation. So what we agreed on together, um, as in your best psychological interest, and also because we're lazy, was that we would just tell you straight up that she was dead and that you would ask no follow-up questions. And in fact, that worked out until you were about 35. So really, we think we made the <laughs> correct choice. Um, and they're like, all that we actually know is that um, she voluntarily gave you up, which turns out not to be true. We vol she voluntarily gave you up and that she was not capable of raising you. And she's like, first off, the fuck. Second off, were you ever going to tell me this? And they were like, well, mm. I mean, there just there wasn't a right time. And then you didn't care. And we had like shit to do. So. So Susan is like the one time in the movie that Susan acts like a normal human being. She's like, fuck this shit. This is ridiculous. And she storms out and she's like, Gare. And he's like. I want to eat my dinner in my big suit, but he's like, Gare. So, like, okay. so they leave together. Um, so Susan's parents, to make it up to her, just show up at her house like one scene later with two baskets of, I'm going to say, banana bread. And she's like, ah, I forgive you. I can't stay mad at you. And I was like, right. You baked. Yeah. I, yeah. You baked me some banana bread. It's the, you, but you also psychologically tortured me for 25 years. Yeah. I guess that evens out because there are two loaves here. So. Cool. Well, it turns out that the way to get Susan to trust you is just to cook for her. Yeah. No, yeah. that definitely is. Yeah. That is the um, the unspoken theme, like underpinning of this movie. Yes. You just feed her. Her mother's like, I made you bacon. And she's like, you may stay forever. I love you <laughs> best. You live here you, now. You are best mom forever. Oh this movie is just... It's oh, so you much. killed okay. Meg? It's fine. Your bacon was so fucking good. It's okay. No, can you make me more of that soup? You put tarragon on the chicken, so Meg is like, it's fine. Who cares? Okay, so um, so Susan storms out. Um, then she makes up with her parents when they give her banana bread because that evens out. Susan gets a letter from Edie where she's like, you're my daughter. I'd like to visit you. And Susan's like, no questions. Thumbs up. Let's do this. So um, Susan immediately goes to visit Edie at Edie's fucking house. And both of us were like, we learned as children that that's how you get murdered by going to a stranger's house. But okay, yes. sure. So Susan and Gare are waiting for the ferry because like half of the movie is Gare just telling women that they're going to be late for their flight and or their ferry. 
and then having <laughs> sex. Like those are his two <laughs> things he does in the movie. And then he just gets to like have a smoke breakout back. It's really, I mean, it's just, it's like the nugget of a gear performance. I love it's it. A, it's a pretty cush. Yeah. Pretty cush job. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to be at the snack table. You just, I'll see you guys later. Okay, so they're waiting at the ferry, and she's wearing what I first thought was a pink linen skirt suit, and then when I watched a little bit, like when I watched it like the fifth time because I'm a glutton for punishment, it's like a pink linen suit jacket top and then like a, I think gray dress pants, like a different color dress pants. But she is dressed fucking up all the way, and she's like, Garris, it's too casual. And I was like, what did, what did even the 90s, like you just were wearing like linen skirt suits everywhere you went. I'm like, that was just, that was just your casual vibe. Anyway. Yeah, no, that feels, that tracks. She's, she's dressed like Marge Simpson in that one episode where Marge gets like a Chanel suit, which is a very specific <laughs> reference, but I feel like everyone should know it because the Simpsons are our cultural Bible. Anyways. Mm. So she brings her Marge Simpson skirt, um, I get pantsuit, I guess. Um, she gets on the ferry, gets on a plane. I guess it's like, it's near, I feel like it's like nearby enough, but somehow there's a plane involved because why not? And she gets to the apartment where Edie lives and the nineties really wanted you to know, uh, what a slum looked like, but it had never seen a slum. So the thought for the movie was what if there are not white people? I think mm-hmm. that was kind of their main vibe for like, let's, let's really indicate that this is not a good area. So mm-hmm. they go, so she, Susan pulls up um, in a taxi cab to the front of this apartment building. And there are um, some like clearly set decorated, like three little artsy bags of garbage on the street. There is a black man sitting on a pile of um, like giant truck tires. And then there's a, uh, I think there's like one, one Hispanic guy and one Asian, no, one Native American guy and one Hispanic guy. There's two people of different ethnicities, neither of whom are white, sitting on the stoop and staring at her. And that's how this movie was like, slum, <laughs> there are men and they're brown. Like, that's how you just <laughs> you knew, like, uh-oh, danger. Like, that's, I mean, it was so not subtle. I was like, why didn't you just have one of the guys sitting there with, like, a heroin needle sticking out of his elbow crack and be like, ma'am, can we you didn't help have me? Heroin My needle yet. stuck. It would have to be crack. I think crack's the 90s. Oh, well, they finally could have just had him being like, could you let my crack pipe? Like, it was just, yeah. it was so, it was so much. And Susan does such a good, oh, no, like, disturbed oh, white lady face. Barrels. Yeah. Let me put my purse in front of me. That was, yeah. I think she actually even does the, like, the two-handed um, little mouse hands on her purse, like, on her way into the building, like, stepping yeah. up. Like, they could have just, you know, in Little Shop of Horrors, like, when they sing that song about um, Skid Row at the very beginning, and there's, like, actual drunks, like, asleep in the gutter in puddles with, like, wine bottles in paper bags, they could have just cut that in, and it would have not seemed heightened compared to the rest of this movie. Like, that is how over-the-top <laughs> fucking ridiculous this was. It was like, the poors! We're afraid of them. So, she steps over, um, you know, the the, <laughs> the guys doing heroin. She goes into the building, and she sees, like, cracks in the walls, and she's like, oh, no, my poor mother. She goes in, um, and I like how when we have seen Edie before all this, they really went for full um, cuckoo bananas, homeless, older lady. So it's like long cardigan and like no makeup and her hair is like a big mess. But the second that she needs to like put on a show for Susan, because she's like definitely like theatrical, like crazy tiger mom. When she has to put on a show for Susan, all of a sudden it's like a blowout, like a professional blowout. And I'm like, you you live in an apartment that costs $8 and an apple every month. And you make like $7 and a peanut from Social Security. How did you get money for a professional fucking blowout? Are you also like a hairdresser in your spare time? So she's got professional blowout hair. She's got her professional makeup. She's got the pearls that ma- earrings that match the pearl necklace. She's got on like like her like fancy going to court skirt suit. And I was like, the fuck did you come from? Like she's she's like already like a weird like shape-shifting witch. And I was like, okay, I'm into this. So um, Susan goes to the door, like knock, knock. And she's like, Oh, you live in a slum. And she's like, yes, I do. So then they, they hang out. Um, they go shopping. They have a lunch date. They go to an art gallery. Um, we find out that, so Susan is studying for her PhD in art history and Edie is, um, a watercolor artist in her spare time, which I feel like probably she learned at the, at the asylum, at the mental health facility. Like that's kind of the vibe I get. Like I learned to paint my feelings. <laughs> so um, Susan's like, like, oh, your art's really good. <laughs> and, and Edie's like, this is a painting of me murdering you. And she's like, oh my God, it's so good. So oh, then they we go both to- love art. That's great. Wow. You really captured my likeness. Yeah. <laughs> you like art. I like art. Clearly, we don't need a DNA test. We are definitely biologically related. And I was mm-hmm. like, okay. We also sure. like sugar in our tea and no cream. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> we're Biology. like already besties, like biological besties. 
They go from zero to 300 so quickly. It's really so fast. And it's not short. It's not 45 no. minutes. It's not like they needed to put it on fast no. forward. No, it's just, it's very, it's sort of, I feel like all of these 90s TV movies, like the, none of the characters are actually characters. They're just sort of like vague, like watercolor splashes of like, I don't know, she's dumb and she's got long hair. Splash. And I was like, I don't, okay, that's, she's dumb, but she likes art history. And okay, sure. Yeah. So anyways, so. Um, they hang out, they end up going to an art gallery. They, they think the same pictures are ugly. So they're already BFFs forever. Um, Edie and Susan talk about why Susan gave her up. Cause she's like, obviously you wouldn't have given me up if there wasn't some terrible, terrible fucking trauma reason. And she's like, well, um, I was just too young and my whole family died and your dad got sent to Vietnam and I wrote him a letter that I was pregnant, but he died before he ever got it. And like, they just like, they slop it on so fucking thick. And like, you might as well hear like, like a tiny violin in the background. She's like, my whole life is trauma. And Susan's like, oh, okay, well, as long as you had like several good reasons. Um, and Edie is like, I was going to name you Pearl. And this will come up. This, this is the part that creeps me out the most in this whole fucking movie is like the crazier that Edie gets the more she's like, oh, Pearl. Oh, my pearl. Oh, precious pearl. And I was like, I don't like it. I don't, I don't like it. I don't, uh-uh. stop, stop bringing up, like, I, it just makes her, it's like, it makes her go from, like, there's almost a chance of her being, like, a nuanced character, like, almost a chance when the movie starts. And then they go right into, what if she's schizophrenic? And I'm like, okay. All right, sure. Fucking pearl. Why not? So Susan's like, um, okay. I'm just gonna just, I'm gonna mentally block that out and keep going. And, um, Susan's like, yeah, I need to not be here now. I'm going to go to my hotel room. And he's like, let me give you this ceramic figurine that was passed down through all the women in my family. And we smuggled it out of Europe when, I don't know, some guy was probably trying to hunt down people like us. You don't need to know any of the details, but bad things happen. But I saved this figurine for you. And she's like, it's a family heirloom. And it went down through all the women. And now it's yours. Don't feel guilty about this at all as you leave me. Like it was just, it was so. It's, it was typical much. boomer bullshit. She was in her presence for five minutes and she's handing her a knickknack that she's going to check in on and she's never going to be oh, able yeah. to let go of. Yeah. It's not a gift, it's a burden. Is it's what a it burden. Was. Yeah. No, that's, I, that was the most triggering part of the movie for me was like, no, not a ceramic figurine. God, you know how many I have in boxes stashed around. <laughs> Yeah, like, no, they give you, they, like, they just, they, like, off-gas them. They, like, you walk into a room and, like, one appears on a shelf, and you're like, no, stop. <laughs> that can't happen. I'm trying not to get cluttered. And they walk out, it's a precious well, and, like, moment. Not, not to put too fine a point on it, but, like, I was looking at this figurine, and I was like, I just don't believe that this thing was passed down through six generations. I think you bought this at the, at the like, thrift store down the street two minutes ago, and then when she tried to yeah. leave you, you were like, no, no, it's a family heirloom. So um, I like that. So Susan um, takes the, the figurine and she's like, okay, I'm going to just go to this hotel room now. It's fine. Um, and she talks to her on the phone. She's like, I feel really bad about this whole situation. Like she's living in a slum. I think I'll just invite her to stay. And Garrett's like, I don't like whatever. Sure. Like another human woman in the house. I'm, I'm pro that. So while she's talking to Garrett on the phone, they have it like they have the framing really weird. The figurine is in the foreground and it looks like the figurine is like spying on her, like, uh, like staring at her the entire time. It's just like a weird like, were you trying to make this an art film? It's like a lifetime movie. Like, why are you guys trying so fucking hard? Like, I just, okay. Like, sure, artsy, artsy doll, whatever. So she's like, I think I should bring her home. And Gare's like, yeah, I don't care. Like, whatever. So um, as she's talking to Gare, we cut back and forth to Edie in Edie's apartment. And Edie is, <laughs> Edie is so angry when she thinks that um, Susan is going to be, like, leaving her for good that she smashes, she fucking Hulk smashes the teapot in her hands, which is an empty teapot. Like, no water comes out. It's just a, she's just hanging on to the teapot for no reason, which is definitely not just held together with the barest glue because she, like, dinks it on the on the table and it explodes. <laughs> <laughs> it fucking explodes everywhere. It's like, what? So it explodes. Somehow it cuts her finger. Um, and she has a photo that Susan has given her of the whole family. So of Gare and Susan and Dylan and Petey and Meg, and they're all just, like, smiling for the camera. And Susan is on the far right side of the picture. So Edie cuts Susan out of the picture. So she has a Susan only picture. And then with her bloody fucking finger, she draws a big circle over everybody else on their side, just to make it really clear what kind of movie we are watching. Like, yeah, just an excellent, um, an excellent, really just deep dive examination into me- mental health issues. Just like thumbs up. So yeah, no accurate. <laughs> 
Um, she's having her like little manic break and drawing circles with her blood. And then bring, bring, Susan's like, oh my God, my husband is going to let me bring you home. So um, please come to my house. And she's like, oh my God, that's so great. I definitely was not planning to murder your whole family already. <laughs> oh my God, let me get my anti-murdering pills. <laughs> which she doesn't have enough of. I'm just going to say right now. So I literally wrote in my notes, I wrote this movie will obviously be a compassionate depiction of mental health. <laughs> so, um, and then I wrote, do not bring insane women into your home. But uh, that, that rule doesn't apply to you, Rachel. No, it's fine. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, so there's, there's, <laughs> you know, there's crazy and guilty and then there's guilty, but also crazy. So yeah. Yeah. It yeah. worked out fine for you. Yeah. You're no, welcome. It's fine. <laughs> because we're all mad here we're so happy (laughs) we're we're so happy so okay so um the second that um that susan brings Edie into her house this movie goes from like crazy but slow and meandering to like bunny boiler like real quick like it goes like all the way up to 11 and then breaks the knob and then beats you to death with the fucking knob so yep okay so she brings so she brings Edie to her house they have a big dinner with um new mommy and old mommy um, and Edie starts pretending that she used to be a nurse. And I feel like she, I feel like this is definitely pretend because later, like she doesn't know how to kill a diabetic. And I don't want to say that I feel like all nurses know how to kill diabetics to kill diabetics, but like she, the, she ends up looking up stuff. Like what does it look like when a diabetic like gets sick basically? So I feel like she's just, I feel like she like would know this stuff if she were. Yeah. So she just makes up that she used to be a nurse. Um, but that she's afraid of needles. And even, even Gare's character is like, well, that seems like bullshit. And she's like, ha ha ha. Talk about something else. So they have their um, deeply problematic dinner where only the women serve the men, which because it's the 90s. It's and, the 90s. Um, uh, it's just, I fucking hate it. I Trad fucking hate wives. It so much. What? Trad wives. Trad wives? Oh, I mean, yeah, but ugh, ugh, I hate it. Okay. So um, they have their great big dinner. Susan brings Edie into her house. So they have like a big like let's meet everybody dinner with new mommy and old mommy and Gare and Dylan and little baby Petey. We've got everybody and Meg and we're all together in the dinner table. And Edie immediately finds out that Verna, so uh, adopted mommy, is diabetic. And she like visually like you can see her be like going to suck that one away. And I was like, oh, no. Oh. So, okay. Then... Edie like immediately proceeds to act on her plan of murdering every single person in Susan's life. And Susan does not pick up on it at all until Edie is actively trying to murder her baby in front of her face and saying, I am murdering everyone to, to, uh, so we, you and I can be together. Like until Susan, until Edie like verbalizes, I am killing everyone. Susan's like, well, that's weird. Huh? Yeah. Where is everybody going? Why is my (laughs) husband so mad? I don't get it. Just so fucking dumb. I, I mean, my handle. adopted mom died and I was sad for like five minutes. That was like four minutes more than I was required. I don't know. Like, this is really hard on me, mommy. And then she and Edie drink straight gin together. And oh, my it's God. All good. What's I feel like it starts out with um, with Susan and Verna have the very best mom daughter relationship ever. And then, yeah, the second she dies, she's like, Mrap. she's like, well, she told mom. me I had a biological mom, I guess. Well, that feels like car. That feels like karma. <laughs> Bye. Just so fucking dumb, this movie. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So step one, got to murder fake mommy. So um, Edie finds out that Verna's diabetic. She steals Martin's prescription pad, which I feel like Martin needs to lock that shit up. He has a teenage boy in the house and also, uh, you know, medical and legal responsibilities, but also a teenage boy. Yeah. So um, he has his, like, prescription pad, like, on his desk in a big box marked, like, don't touch. So um, Verna, so Edie grabs the prescription pad she grabs um, Gare's great big book of how to murder a diabetic. She figures out how to murder a diabetic. She writes herself a prescription for insulin at some kind of like extra high compounding or extra high dosage or something. She goes to Verna and Dewey's house. She's like, oh my God, the food is so good. Um, I have to use the bathroom, please, with my purse. Even though, as you said, she's definitely postmenopausal. So what, are you bringing like a book to the shit or what are you doing? Like, why, yeah. do you, why would you ever bring, I mean, what else do you need in there that's not like... I'm I'm on my period tools. Anyways, so um if you have an answer, please feel free to email us at garrickandgetit at gmail.com. Okay. So she grabs her giant purse, she goes to the bathroom, she um uses a syringe to switch out the medicine. And I was like, why wouldn't you just switch out the bo-? I mean, I guess it's smarter because if you just switched out the tiny bottles, maybe Dewey would read it and be like, Oh, you're supposed to be a 10 out of 90 percentage and you're actually and this is a 80 out of 90 percentage and I don't, like but yeah. it's, I don't it's know. in case but they it, check later i 
Yeah, I guess that makes sense because it would be like this was written for for Edie. Oh, look at that movie. You're being so smart. Mm. It just seemed like an extra step from a woman who was like in the middle of a psychotic breakdown. But uh, sure, yeah, let's make her smart. Yeah, no, she's good at murdering though. She's- uh, she is so good at murder. She's the – well, she's the best but only because Susan is so fucking dumb. I yeah. Feel like. Yeah. So, so um, Edie like – Uses her syringe to pull insulin out of one bottle, put it in another bottle, like do the reverse, like switcheroo. So the the original bottle is now filled with like super high deadly poison insulin. And she's like, oh my God, what a good lunch. And then she pieces out. So then Dewey goes to make Verna dinner and she's upstairs like folding laundry. And we get to see her violently like f- fall on the floor and like flop like a fish and and like choke and die. And I was like, well, okay. Yeah. The 90s are going pretty hard for this one. Anyways, so... um. Edie has made it look like an accident. Verna dies upstairs. Dewey is trying to make some kind of weird meatloaf that involves no meat, but like 40 pounds of celery in the kitchen. Because whenever they yeah. have men cook in 90s movies, it's just, it's weird and wrong. And I don't know why. Yeah. Well, that's because, yeah. Yeah. I can't cook worth shit. And even I was like, where's the meat for the meatloaf? Like, it was just so weird. <laughs> He's like, I have 17 oranges and a, and a pipe wrench and, and some apples and some hairpins. I'm going to make yeah, meatloaf. This is my like, secret Sir. recipe. Yeah. I'm telling yeah. you, every man has a secret recipe and they're proud of it because it has like 17 ingredients and it takes all day to cook. And they'll all tell you that. Oh, it takes all day to cook. And it's got like a bunch of ingredients. Like, oh, yeah, that's how you know it's good. He has an entire – so it's like Verna and Dewey also have like a really nice 90s kitchen that I'm not going to pretend I wasn't super jealous of. But it's like he has like a very wide, long kitchen counter like for preparing stuff. And the entire counter is full of onions and carrots and celery and like every – like it is so full of vegetables. And I was like, but sir, you said you were making meatloaf. Me- meatloaf. I- anyways, so he's making his like 17-part, seven-hour meatloaf. And he doesn't hear her being like, Dewey – do we all know? And she like bops her face off the fucking floor and dies. Like it is just, it is yeah. kudos to this actress. Cause I was like, oh ma'am, are you okay? Like you really, I, I heard your skull. You point. went like, hard. I don't, <laughs> you physically went hard. Like either you or like the, the ADR guy, like really wanted me to hear that like blink. And I was like, oh no. Oh, they broke a woman's skull for a lifetime movie. She's dead now in real life. <laughs> this is bad. So anyways, so we see her violent death. And then Dewey, we see the funeral. And then um, <laughs> every time that Garrett tries to comfort Susan, Edie like gets like a like a mommy no no boner alert, and she like slides between them and shoves him away. And Verna is now dead. Dewey is like, um, I'm gonna just spend some time with my sister, which means that Dewey is the only smart character in this entire fucking movie. He like senses shit on the wind. And he's like, I'm gonna be not here. Goodbye. Yeah. We never see him again. He just pieces out. It's fine. So. Now we've got Verna out of the way. We've got Dewey out of the way. Um, we've got Grandma um, Edie in the house, and she keeps trying to get baby Petey to, like, love her, even though she also hates baby Petey. Like, she – I don't know if she just wants Susan to think she likes baby – maybe it's just that. She just wants Susan to think she likes the baby so she can get close to the baby and then, like, throttle the life out of it later. But, like, anytime that the parents are around, she's like, oh, baby Petey, I love you, baby Petey, like, have some crackers. And the second that they're around – that they leave, she gets on, like – she gets, like, a deep – like a, um, like the voice from like when Reagan is possessed by the by the demon in The Exorcist. You know the your mother sucks, yeah. sucks cocks in hell. Yeah. So she gets like the your mother sucks cocks in hell voice. She's like, "Ah, oh, you're a little pig, you're a little pig, Petey." And I was like, "I don't like this movie. No. This movie hurts my heart. This is just such a weird. Like, I want to know what happened to this baby if he has any possible recollection of being in this movie because it would be the weirdest fucking shit that you would remember. Yeah. Like I remember some random old lady just like swearing at me and throwing crackers at my face. Like I just like what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and spoiler alert for later like when she's holding this baby over a bathtub when because she's gonna try to like boil the baby later like that bathtub had like visible steam coming off of it and i don't know how great we were at special effects in the 90s but like to me that looked like an actual boiling bathtub <laughs> so like i am not comfortable like i am not comfortable with like the level of child endangerment in this movie but anyway okay so um grandma Edie is like trying to get baby Petey to like her and baby Petey likes meg because you know, Meg has been like taking care of him this entire uh, time. Yeah. So uh Grandma Edie is out for blood now. This is this will not stand. So um Edie first starts with criticizing Meg, because you gotta break them down psychologically before you kill them. That's just how it goes. So she's like, You're not cooking the right way, you're not cleaning in the right way. Um, what if, I don't know, you just left this house and never came back and went to college or whatever the fuck? I don't care what you do. What if you just were not here ever again? You're in the way of my uh plan for 
ruining this fucking family. And Meg is like, uh, no, I actually like my job. So pass. So stop being creepy. So Meg sees Edie delete a voicemail from Verna. And then she sees Edie smash a framed photo of Verna, Dewey and Susan. Um, like she's like, she like is seeing all this weird shit and like, Meg also is like not a moron like Susan and is putting pieces together and is like, mm, crazy lady seems crazy. Yeah. But like everyone else in this movie, they all have suspicions and no one will fucking talk to anybody else. No one will will say these suspicions to anybody. They're just like, well, I guess I'll just keep this to myself and hope she doesn't murder again because, you know, she's a little lady. So um, Edie then follows Meg up the stairs when she's putting baby PD down for a nap. And it's one of those cribs that you said is now illegal with like the yeah, the drop sides. The drop side. Fr- um, yeah. I was going to say fridge. That's awful. That is a weird slip of tongue. The drop <laughs> <laughs> The drop side crib, um, which you said is now illegal. Um, so Edie sees Meg put the baby in there and like latch up the side and then like stands there looking like, you know, when the Grinch smiles in the cartoon and he has that weird fucked up smile that like goes all the way up to his eyebrows. Yeah. That is what this old woman is doing. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, and she it's- does it really well too because you want to punch her in the face every time. You want to punch does her so it. hard. Yeah. You would, she is so. I'm like, she, oh, I'm you're sure- selling that because I hate you. I'm sure, like, as a human being, she is lovely. But, like, in this movie, I want to just punch her until she doesn't move. Like, it just creeps – she creeps me out so fucking hard. I'm just like, no. Like, mm, no. like just It's wasp creepiness, which I feel yeah. like I can't really – I can't really explain. But just, like, it's it's wasp creepiness. And if you get it, you get it. So she sees um, Meg put the side of the crib up, waits, like, 35 seconds. Like, Meg is probably not even out of the room when she's like, ha-ha, and, like, throws the side of the crib down. So she throws the side of the crib down. Meg is in the kitchen, like, cooking. Susan comes home, like roars around the corner with her. Um, I feel like it's like a station wagon or something. It's like a long car. It's a Volvo. Comes, it's a Volvo. Volvo so station she, wagon. Oh, I got half of it. So she comes around the corner with her station wagon. She um, hits the button, the controller for her garage door. It comes up, and somehow Petey has like spider monkeyed himself out of the crib. I mean, I get like I get how you get out of the crib if the side is down, but somehow he's gotten from the upstairs where he sleeps down the main stairs of the house with no one seeing him and then somehow into the garage all the way to where the garage door is? Like, is this a ninja baby? Like, this doesn't make any fun. Like, the main problem... (laughs) Well, the main problem with this movie is that, like, it is fucked up beyond belief. The second problem is that it, like, it only makes sense in the Forever Night universe where you assume everyone is flying. Yeah. Because they will pop up in weird places that they could not physically get to. But they'll just be like, bloop! And I'm like, okay, I mean, Gare's a vampire... Ilya Woloshin, also a vampire. I'm just going to assume the baby is half vampire, and that's yeah. how he gets to where he has to get. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, otherwise, no sense. Okay, so um, little half vampire baby ends up in the garage, and Susan nearly runs over him. And I'm going to say that um, I just hope that they were very good at creative camera angles. Because watching this, I fully believe that she was zooming with this car, and that baby was right the fuck there, like about to be crushed under her tires. Like, I was like, I... I don't feel like child services was like watching that carefully when this movie was made. Like I, yeah, I, that like, like years off that baby's life. Like I don't like you guys got rogue. Like I'm, you know what you just, I'm going to just, I'm going to choose to believe that like they were that good at, um, at stunts and shit because it just, it feels like they were like, well, there's more babies where that one came from. Like it just did not feel good to watch this. Forced so she, perspective. I think yeah, that's called that's, forced perspective. Yeah. I mean, I think in this movie it's called Child Endangerment. But mm, it's yeah, not. also that. But I, mm. <laughs> but I choose to believe that they were that good. They were like, no, no, we don't have to spend money on um, the script and definitely not on clothing, on costuming. Like, mm, no. No, no, no. Um, nothing on makeup or props. But we're going to spend all of our money on making this one stunt where this kid almost gets run over by a car looks so real that you, like – make women in the audience stress out a little bit because they're like, oh, no, that's a baby about to get murdered. Anyways, so um, thankfully, Susan stops the car right before she crushes the baby's head like a watermelon. And she runs in the house with the baby. And she's like, Meg, Meg, you have to be more careful. And I'm just like, first off, how the fuck? And like, second off, like, Meg has been there for a long time. And it yeah. sounds like this has never happened. And all of a sudden it happens one time when your crazy um, bio mommy that you haven't seen in 25 years showed up like, Let's put two and two together here. Yeah. And not get 17, which is where she lands every time. So anyways, so Meg is super upset. Meg goes into her room where she has like a like a prison college dorm bed, like a like a twin extra small somehow. Yeah. Like it is the saddest <laughs> little bed. And so she's sitting there listening to her Walkman because she's a cool 90s 
at air quote teen, um, 35 year old teenager. And Edie comes in with a sandwich and like keeps touching her all over oh, her gross. clavicle. It's it is gross. upsetting. It's, it's too like, much. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know why it works with Gare? Because one, he's a man. But two, he like grabs you on the shoulders. The shoulders are a safe place. Don't fucking like just reach over and spider touch someone's clavicle because that's a bad touch. There's no, there's no, you know what? Like someone will tell you if it's a good touch. If they haven't told you, it's a bad touch. Don't do it. <laughs> so she's sitting there on the bed. Um, Edie comes in and is just like, let me just spider touch all over the front of you. Like I own you. And like touches all of her, her um, crystal necklaces and shit. And she literally, she literally is like, um, wow, that was a really traumatic day. You know, if that had happened to me, I would definitely fucking kill myself. Okay. Bye bye, and like walks out, and I was like, "Oh, cold bitch! What did you literally just be- tell her to kill herself?" Fucking nineties, okay? Like you were yes. going hard. Fucking, you were going so 90s. hard. This movie is so nineties. Anyways, so after telling Meg to kill herself, Meg doesn't, because good job, Meg. And then, um, I think, I think maybe like at this point, like Edie's thinking, oh, th- th- she's going to get fired, that, that Meg will be fired and that's how I get rid of her. But the Nolans have known her for more than five minutes and they're like, just, you know, maybe watch where the baby is in future. Like, you know, we all have, we all have oopsies. The kid is fine now. So Meg definitely, she's like, no one else saw me pull the crib up, the side of the crib up. Like, I know I did it. You know I did it. It was definitely you, you crazy old bitch. So Meg is on to Edie. And yet, 30 seconds later, when Edie's like, will you come out to my garden as I hold this giant hoe malevolently? She's like, okay. I mean, I I got soup on the stove. And I was like, you know she's a crazy bitch. Is it just because she's like four feet tall and like 72 years old that you don't think she's going to hurt you? Like, anyways, like no one in this movie has any kind of like brain power. And I feel like that's the only way that this movie goes forward is the movie like mentally handicaps all of them. But anyways, Meg's like, okay, come out to this garden where there's lots of hiding places and um, tools that are sharper than kitchen knives. Yeah, easily dug holes. Okay, so Meg goes out there um, and Edie kills her with a hole and buries her in the garden and then throws away all of Meg's stuff while singing a creepy as fuck song about pigeons. Horrifying. Horrifying. I don't like villains who sing songs to themselves. It's like deeply upsetting to me. And like who sing songs in like Divya sing song baby voice. I don't like it. I don't like it. Now so just anyways. imagine it all with a laugh track. I, that's worse. That's so much worse. Why do you think that, <laughs> that makes it better? It's horrifying. It's so, this movie. I am trying to like, I'm trying to like better push relative. through this movie, but it is. Ugh. Okay. So um, a cop shows up, an old man cop who I just, God bless this man. He He has to. He has to act like um, like he is just taking a hot cookie off of a tray that Edie offers him. And like, sir, I don't like I, I don't know how to teach you how to fake hold a hot cookie, but whoever taught you was wrong because he he's holding like the saddest, coldest, like <laughs> rubber cookie that's been there for a week. And he's like, oh, ah. And I was like, sir, I just could you okay. I okay. could have handed so, him an actual hot cookie, it would have been better. I, for the sake of this performance, I am okay with burning this old man. And I'm just, yeah. just going to mm-hmm. say that. Yeah. So he, uh, first off, okay. This cop um, shows up twice in this movie. He is an older gentleman. I feel like maybe early 60s, late 50s, that kind of age. He is built like a brick shit house. He is like six foot five. Edie is like a little tiny plump muffin woman. And she's like, if she's five foot five, like I would be super surprised. Like she's a little little tiny woman. This will become important later, but I just need everyone to understand. This is not like junior officer Wiggins showing up for his first day of work. This guy looks like he could punch his hand through a wall. He is a big, solid older man. So he shows up, he fake eats his fake hot cookie. um, And and he's asking questions about Meg because Edie has just told everyone, oh, you know, she just, uh, disappeared she just ran away i think she said she has a boyfriend in spain and she was definitely flighty and like not good with responsibility and dylan is sitting there going what the fuck are you talking about she was very responsible she definitely did not have a secret spaniard boyfriend where the fuck did you get that and (laughs) Edie looks at him the way that uh my parents would have looked at me if i corrected them in front of an adult which is i will murder you later but not here in front of this adult so dylan does not catch up with this. Um, and now he's on her shit list. Like, I feel like we go through, like, she kills one person and then someone else makes, like, an offhand remark and she's like, now you're on my murder list. She's like the fucking Terminator 
Yeah. Even though she's like this five foot four little like muffin woman. I don't even. Okay. So she's like, I'm going to kill Dylan now. So um, Edie starts stealing money from around the house and breaking her definitely not a uh, family antique ceramic figurine that she gave Susan. And she blames all of it on Dylan. Dylan gets grounded and he 100% knows that it is Susan. Like she's not even trying to hide it. She's like tent, tent pulling her fingers. And at one point she sticks her tongue out at him. Like it's just, it's, it's full cuckoo bananas. So um, he's trying to get anyone else in the house to listen to him. And they're all like, no, nah, she's just like an annoying old lady. And he's like, she is dangerous. She is a motherfucking psycho. And Meg didn't like, didn't disappear. And the old lady didn't have an accident until kooky Edie showed up. Like, can we all just put the pieces together? And everyone's like, ah, and, like teenagers. What the fuck do you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 So you just don't want to be grounded. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Okay. So, um, anyway, so Gary's like, look, I will, let me talk to, let me talk to Dylan. Um, I just like, let's just have like a father son, a father son moment. And so Gary is like, look, let me just have a father son moment with Dylan. Like, let me just talk to him and figure out like why all of a sudden he's acting out so much. And um, Dylan is like, she's crazy. And Gary's like, look, none of us like her, but like we have to, she's your stepmom's mom. And like, we have to, you know, buck up and, and try and be friendly and she'll be gone at some point. Eventually, probably she won't live here forever. I don't know. But maybe also, yes. But maybe also, yes. Yeah. That's definitely the vibe of this conversation. Like, I don't know. So <laughs> I like, I like the secret characteristic that comes out in the scene. Cause like at this point, the movie has just given me so much bullshit. It's like, I bet you need a little bit of loving in your life. And I was like, yes, movie. Yes, I do. So Gare, so Gare's patented lady moves are to go um, rub his cheek, like all over your forehead, like to leave his scent Mm -hmm. and then to use his fingers to spider grab all over your neck and shoulders. And like, also like he does that thing where he's like, um, your neck is not where I need it to be. So I'm just going to physically move your neck into a position that is better for me. And he's like, yeah, moved you over. So he like does like the daddy son version of that with his kid. And I was like, it works. It works. It feels, it feels correct. But also like, if you, if you like analyze what he is doing with his body, it also feels like, are, are there are there dads and sons who are like cat people like where they are like Meow, and they just like rub their face <laughs> on your on your face is that yes two it- and they're in this movie <laughs> this is how vampires express their love they just mash their faces like like when a cat walks up to you and like headbutts you that's yeah. kind of what he does he's like headbutt of love <laughs> <laughs> god dad i told you no <laughs> <laughs> not in public dad <laughs> It's just like it feels like when you're watching it, it feels it feels like this is a real father and son and like this is their relationship and they love each other. But if you if you like watch it with an eye to like what are they doing, it's sort of like, what are they do like what? Okay. You know what? They're vampires and they're cat people. And maybe it's that's fine. why they don't understand how human people work. They're like, I don't know, this ED seems weird, but morale. <laughs> 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 This movie is much better if you imagine it taking place in the Cat People universe. I'm just yeah, that like, out there. oh, kill your enemies? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, I brought mm-hmm. you a dead rat and some fish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, All is forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it makes so much sense. Right, right? Don't the pieces line up a little bit better? Yeah, if you give Susan food people? and she's like, oh, fuck, yeah, no, forget everything. It explains why um, characters just disappear and then pop up in random places that you don't know how yeah. they got to. Cat mm-hmm. people. No, yeah. this works. Yeah, no, this yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome, movie. I made you better. Okay. So Gare does his cat people um, discussion with his son, and they're all besties again. And then <laughs> um, Dylan makes the mistake of saying to Edie, my dad doesn't like you either. And Edie's like, bing, <laughs> murderer boner. So she's like, mm, okay. So um, we have a scene where, so Edie is trying, well, as soon as Meg dies, Edie tries to like take over the role of like mommy dearest housekeeper. She starts dressing like a 1950s housewife with like a full on like bouffant, which again, I don't know where that came from, but she like brought her own apron and like poofy sundress with like tool underneath. I'm like, ma'am, you live in a slum. Where did you get a fucking tool 1950s like hostess dress anyways whatever it doesn't matter so she's trying to take care of everyone in the house um 
she starts cooking like super elaborate giant meals. Like they all come down for breakfast, which um, I very much enjoyed the scene where Gare and Susan run down the stairs like they're going to like Christmas morning. They're both wearing their gym jams <laughs> and they like can't keep their hands off each other. And they're like, tee hee, tee hee. And they're like running down the stairs like like snuggling each other. And I was like, oh, look at this young, old, young love. Oh, so good. Yeah. So they, they run down the stairs and Edie has made like – seven animals worth of food she is cooking with both hands at the same time yeah yeah Yeah. it's full it feels like um like rosie from the jetsons like it feels like if you had a robot maid that you were like what if you cooked all the food in my fridge and she was like beep boop all the food like that's what that is fully what she does there's like seven pounds of bacon and then there's like sausage and then there's there's um like eggs and toast and orange juice and it's like i squeezed it myself like she goes full like how does that not how does that? How is that not the first red flag? Like I know that you, she killed a bunch of people, and somehow that was not a red flag. You come down, and she has somehow um, turned your kitchen into like a Vegas hotel breakfast buffet. Yeah. I just feel like that's the sign of an unwell woman. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> I'm just gonna throw that out there. <laughs> Anyways, so um, <laughs> she makes breakfast for everyone, and Gare like has to has to get on the ferry and has to go to work. And um, as we know, Gare don't eat. He don't eat. So no she's got eat. all of her food there and she's like, do you want this? And he's like, no, nah, I'm good. She's like, how about this? What if I like stuff some bacon in your pocket? You can eat it on the ferry like a wild animal. And he is like, no eat. And I was like, oh, no eat. <laughs> no eat. <laughs> oh, forever night comes back. Anyways, so um, Gare eats one thing and it is faces. It is human women's faces. Yes. It is not bacon he's and He's only eggs, hungry so. for one type of food. <laughs> <laughs> he only wants one thing to nourish him in this mm-hmm, life. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he's like, no eat. And I was like, oh, no eat. So um, Edie now knows that Gare is not happy that she lives in his house in his house forever. It has now been two months. This movie kind of yada yada. Two it? months. Two months. This random woman. Yes, they are bi- biologically related. But considering they've never met before, she is still a random woman. Yeah. Yeah, my understanding is like their first meeting. So Susan stays in a hotel, so I'm guessing it's meant to be like at least a weekend, like more than one day. But it's been like two days, and then she's like, "What if you come and live in my house for fucking ever?" I just horrifying. So okay, so it's been like two months, and Gary's like, "This bitch needs to not be in my fucking house." So he's like, "I will buy her an apartment. I will buy her furniture." I will move her to a safer part of town. I will physically move all of her shit. She needs to not be here. Like whatever. Yeah. I have money. I will use my money to solve this problem. Let me use my money to solve yeah. this problem. Yeah. It would that, that's a that's a great solution. That would be great. Yeah. But like it doesn't work when all the characters are either dumb or psychotic. So um <laughs> Edie now knows that Gare doesn't want her in the house, that Gare wants her to like live somewhere else. So she's like, I'm gonna start this campaign of terror against him. And this is when the movie was like, What if we were already crazy? What if we made this so fucking crazy? That no human being would be able to watch it without their eyes bleeding from their fucking forehead. That Ooh. is how hard this movie goes. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they chose <laughs> violence. They chose fucking violence. Is this as bad as um, Teddy Bear Blowjob? No. 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 But that no. bar is impossibly high. Yeah. That bar is astronomically no, That's just in the category the all moon. its own. It's yeah. not apples to apples. It's no. not. No. It's apples no. to oranges. You can't compare the two. What's well, like apples to car bombs. Do you yeah. mean like like car bomb all the way up there, teddy bear blowjob? This is like I wanted an apple and you gave me um, a compost heap that you then sprayed like like an apple room spray on top of. I am still not happy. Thank you. It's not a car bomb, but I'm still not happy. So let's right. just dive into the fucking insane bullshit that happens now. And we're all going to just throw up in our mouths a little bit and we're going to get through this. Okay. So she knows that Gary doesn't want her there. Um she now uses this as her excuse to try and fucking murder him and ruin his life and make him act, make him lose his mind. Gare has been Gare level advanced horny for this entire movie. Every time he and Susan are alone together, they're throwing each other up against every single piece of furniture in the entire fucking house and also the walls. Like any surface that can support a body, it's like wham, 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 bleh, and they're just like making out. And I'm like, good, thank you. I needed a little palate cleanser and I like that you got to see her palate physically be cleansed by him. Okay, so we have a scene where Gare and Susan are in the kitchen. Um, I think they've just come home from um, Dylan's PTA meeting where they like he's been skipping classes and it's not good. So they're like, oh, we got to deal with that later. 
Um, he's like, we need some alone time. And he's like, oh my God, look, it like turns out we're alone right now. What are the odds? So I guess we better just get it on. And she's like, yeah, we definitely should. So they are making out through the kitchen and then they get to the stairwell, like the really long, steep stairwell up to the second floor where the bedrooms are. And he throws her against both sides of the stairs. He ping pongs her up the fucking stairs <laughs> with the power of his boner magic. And I was like, okay, this, thank you. Yes. No, this thank is you. what this movie needed. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. You knew it was dragging a little in. bit. All yeah. Right. I'm here now. Yeah. yeah. I was tired of all the crazy and how no one could see the crazy. And you, you saved it with dick magic. So you like, just thank you. reeled me back in. Yeah. 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 So they are physically like bouncing each, each other off the fucking walls and giggling and ripping their clothes off up the stairs. And then it keeps cutting to Edie in her also like twin extra large bed, like rocking back and forth. Like, I hear it. I hear my daughter being touched by a man. And I was like, uh, uh, okay. Then we go back to horniness. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to focus on the horniness. They are in bed. They're having a semi-graphic sex scene. Like there's like, there's like stuff happening. I'm not mad about it. Gear, when you first see the scene, so um, Susan is wearing a cute little like silk or um, satin kind of a champagne colored negligee. Like it's very, it's very cute. It's yeah. very 90s. It's like strappy. He is not wearing a shirt when you first see him. Um, and he's like kind of rolling over towards her. So you see like shoulder and arm. He's not wearing a shirt. So um, as the makeout is just about to happen, I think you see their lips like about to like lock on the bed. <laughs> Edie does not knock on their door. She fucking does what like like what my um, great Pyrenees does when he wants to go into a room, which is he walks up to the door and then police kicks it open. <laughs> <laughs> Bam! So she walks up to the door and is like, I hear a dick about to be somewhere near my daughter. Can't have that. Walks up to the door. Bam! The door pops open and Gary's like, ah! <laughs> and Susan's like, holy shit! <laughs> the camera... So the camera is closest to Susan. So she's on, like, we're on the side of the bed where Susan is, and then Gary's, yeah. like, behind next to her. I don't know if this room was really cold or um, the actress who played Susan was, like, a method actress, but I'm just I'm just going to say it. Her nipples are rock hard through this little <laughs> silk nighty. There's a lot of side boob going on, too. And there's a lot of side boob. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be honest. Yeah, this I didn't is pretty this- risque. I didn't see the side boob because I was like, what? What is going? Are those, are those pencil erasers? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh, oh, ma'am. It's okay. We, we diversified. I I saw the side boob. You saw the <laughs> nipples. And here we are. Yeah. And together we make one full picture of this movie. Yeah. So um, I, I feel so bad. So she's sitting there. You see you see nip and side boob. And then they obviously did like – like there was a cut. There was like a second take because Gare had – he was without a sh- without a shirt and like not covered like when he's first – like when they're first doing the sex scene. The second that Edie like wham, like police stomps through the door, he now has a sheet all the way fucking around him like he's a little old lady and he's cold. And I was like, sir, <laughs> sir, really? Like, he, like you don't even – like you were, you were behind her – all we see are nipples and side boob. Like, and it's like dark in the room because you guys were supposed to just be having sex. We only see the light coming from the doorway to the hallway, which is where Edie is standing. So like the amount of like ability to see any of your upper body is already so restricted and limited. Like no one was going to see, I know you're never nude and you've committed to that lifestyle and I respect it, but like no one was going to see anything anyways. And instead you were like, no, no, one second guys, all the sheets, <laughs> like, wrap, it, wrap it all up, body condom. I was like, I was like, okay. I mean, you give and you take away. That's yeah, that's fine, sir. Anyways, so Edie's like, oh my god, did I like, did I like interrupt something? And like, Gary's like halfway inside her daughter. He's like, no, I guess not. All right, let me. So, um, Edie's like, yeah, it's the straight. Like, it turns out I have a headache because I sensed that sex was happening and it made my brain hurt. So I have a real bad headache. Do you guys have aspirin anywhere? And um, and Susan's like, yeah, let me, I'll let me just you know dismount and then I'll go and I'll get you some, I'll get you some aspirin. So we go back to Edie's bedroom while she's waiting. And she's sitting there again with that weird, like, Grinch evil psycho grin. And she opens up her um, her bedroom drawer and she has her bottle of lithium, which, again, this lady needs more than lithium. <laughs> like, lithium is not fixing this problem. <laughs> lithium is not touching the problem that we have. But she has a second bottle of aspirin. And she is, like, she hasn't thrown the aspirin out or, like, down the toilet or anything. She has just fucking dumped the bottle into the drawer. <laughs> and I'm like, that doesn't... That doesn't make it seem like you don't have aspirin. It makes it seem like your hands were real shaky and you couldn't get the pills back in the bottle. It does not solve your your make this look look subtle and natural problem the way you right. think it does. But like, okay. 
So, um, so anyway, so Susan goes in and gives her the pills and no sex happened that night and we're all bummed out. So then, um, Edie's like, what if, um, I know that Gary is a human man who enjoys having sex because there was one moment where he was about to have sex. So what if I play on that to go full fucking crazy? What if, um, knowing that horny is the only characteristic we have given to Dr. Martin Nolan, um, what if I start hitting on him in a way that makes him think he's losing his mind and also makes him so disgusted he leaves the fucking house? So at first, Edie um, calls him into her bedroom and they're talking and she's sitting there in a pink bathrobe. Brushing her hair. Brushing her hair seductively. And mm-hmm. I just feel like you need to either wear something under your bathrobe or like, you know when your tits are out, okay? Yeah. You know when your tits are out. Oh, like, she knew. She knew. She knew. I, I know. Yeah. But it's like, okay, so this actress who plays, um, it's Diane Ladd who plays uh, who plays Edie. She has, <laughs> she clearly went to the tanning booth. And I know this because she has an orange tan that goes just up to like right above the cup of the of her bra that is visible, like um, underneath her pink bathrobe. But not all the way down to the cup of her bra because it goes orange skin, milky white glow in the dark skin, top of the cup of her bra. All of it showing through her like pink fuzzy bathrobe as she seductively, slowly brushes her hair while making unbroken contact with Gare. And I was like, that must be weird for Gare to get the unbroken fuck me stare. Do you know what I mean? Like he's normally yeah. the one giving the unbroken like, fuck no, me stare. Is this what this feels like? <laughs> oh. I don't feel good. I don't feel good. This, I don't, I don't like good. this on this side. <laughs> this isn't how this goes <laughs> i've only ever done this i've never received this i don't like it i don't he he literally looks like he should be wearing a cardigan so that he can clutch it closer to himself and be like no i don't know <laughs> don't look at me ma'am <laughs> like like he should put on an extra coat to like per, like yeah just to make his never nude self feel better just like wrap up a little so um i don't even remember what they have a conversation about it's just unbroken fuck me eye contact and he's like uh i need to not be here so he leaves um, and I think she was making some like vaguely suggestive con- comments, but like, I couldn't even listen to her. Cause I was just like, why, why can I see your, your nude boob color anyway? Yeah. So then she's like, well, that didn't work. He doesn't seem to be fully insane yet. I'm going to ramp this up another notch. And I was like, movie, you've ramped it up to like, like a 14. I need you to, I can't, where else do we go from here? No more ramping. And the movie was like, hold my beer. No more ramping. Oh my God. It got so much more. Okay. This is, I hate this so fucking, I hated this. You know what? I think I hated this more than teddy bear blowjob because teddy bear blowjob was just weird. Mm. Like it was so weird that my brain like could not Couldn't quite fathom process what it. I was looking at. Yeah. Yeah. This, I knew what I was looking at. I didn't like, well, I sort of knew. Anyways. Okay. It's weird. It's so weird. Okay. So Gare is, um, he's in his bedroom and he's like, uh, where's my razor? And I'm like, sir, you don't even have stubble. What the fuck are you? Sh-? Anyways. Okay. Sure. You need your razor. So he's like, I need my razor. And Susan's like, oh yeah, my mom took it. She needed to shave something. And I was like, okay, that's problem number one, but okay. So he goes to her room. She is, she is shaving. Okay. So she, okay. So he go, I can't even, okay. So Gare goes to this woman. I know this is having a hard time. <laughs> Gare goes to the old lady's room and he's like, Hey, do you have my razor? And she is standing there in again, the pink bathrobe. She has one leg up on a chair. She is using the razor to shave the outside of her thigh, like from her butt down towards her knee, but like the lower side, like of the part of your leg you would sit on. While making unbroken eye contact with him and also like making it seem like maybe she just shaved her pussy with it. Like that's. Yeah. Cause she's got her, her bathrobe on and she's just barely clutching it shut. Like, oopsies, this could fall open at any minute. Again, unbroken eye contact. Yeah. And I just, oh, and, and. They film it, they kind of film it the way they would film like like a seductive scene in an old movie with like Vaseline on the lens. Like it yes. has it has like a weird blur filter going on. So it's like the movie wants us even to see this as like as like a horny sexual thing. And I'm like, no movie, I don't want to see this as a horny sexual thing. I didn't like the old lady shaving her butt. I don't like her shaving her butt with Gare's razor. I don't like her shaving her butt with Gare's razor while staring at Gare in a bathrobe that is just about to pop out because I don't need to see Diane Ladd's nips. I don't, I, yeah. I'm sure they're great. I don't want to see them. Gare doesn't want to see them. We don't want to see them. I got that she was nuts by literally every single thing you showed me in the last 
75 hours of this movie, which I know it's only a two hour movie, but it felt like three years. It felt it fe- so long. It felt so long. I am tr- I am truncating so much right now and it's, it felt like the longest movie I've ever seen and yet I couldn't look away because I was like, the fuck? And then something new would happen and I was like, the double fuck? Like it just kept coming and coming. Like there's a scene where she like pokes a dog with a stick. It's just, it's so weird, this movie. Okay, so she's like, Hey, Gare, I fucked myself with your razor. And he's like, nope. <laughs> he just turns away. He turns around. And he's like, I don't need that razor anymore. Goodbye. I'm gone. <laughs> so he turns around um, and he tries to tell Susan. He's like, "Um, your wife, your wife, your mom is being sexually inappropriate with me. And I was like, how many times did it take you to get through that, Gare? Like, this lady is sexually inappropriate with me and I didn't like it. Like, was that hard for you to say And I didn't hook. (laughs) Hang on. I didn't hook. (laughs) Guys, I can do this. No, I can do this. No, I can imagine, I can imagine myself being in a situation where a woman hits on me and I don't like it. I can just, I'm an actor. This is what, imagining is what I do. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. (laughs) (laughs) Sucking himself up. Okay. So um, he somehow manages to get through um, a woman hitting on him and him, his response being, I don't like it. Um, and Susan is like, you're crazy. Like that would never happen. And she, she makes comments that like, it feels like she's not saying that because it's like, it's crazy because it's my mother and my mother wouldn't hit on her daughter's husband. That's weird. She says it like they wouldn't hit on you. And I was like, ma'am, 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 I, ma'am. delusional, delusional. And I knew it before, but the fact that you're like, yeah. Gare, come on. She wouldn't you, hit on you. you. Yeah, honey. yeah, right? Honey. Is that not the vibe that you get from it, it where she's it, like, are you imagining? And he's like, I th- Yeah, it's like, oh, you think everyone hits on you. That's what it feels like. Like, oh, great. Another person you think is hitting on you. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, maybe Cause, everybody kind of do. does, Susan. <laughs> do. <laughs> he releases a pheromone. We've established this. It's not a conspiracy theory if it's the truth. <laughs> That weird purple haze you see everywhere you go is why all the women are fainting, <laughs> Susan. But yeah, it's sort of like, it's like, why couldn't you, like, you couldn't even play that line normally? Like, there's a legitimate reason for her to be suspicious of him saying that. Like, my mom wouldn't hit on you. Like, you're my husband. Like, that, like that's crazy. Why would you think? Yeah. Like, that's that's the one time that she could call someone else crazy. And I would have been like, I, you seem like a normal human being. I, that's a normal human being's response to the situation. I would get it. But no, yeah. she's like, no, the way that she plays it is she wouldn't hit on you, Gare. Like, stop being so fucking full of yourself. And I'm just like, okay, first off, factually inaccurate, first off. Yeah, Second off, off, like, how is that, how is that your response? Like, how is that, I don't know. Like, you just, you read the line in a way that pisses me off is like, is basically what happened. Anyways, so Gare's like, okay, you don't believe me. Um, I definitely believe Dylan now. So I, so Dylan and I are going to go to the club. And I was like, oh, that sounds fancy. And then they film it at like a run, rundown fucking shack <laughs> the motel. The worst motel. <laughs> the worst. He's like, the club, the Bay Club. We're going to go stay at the Bay Club. And I was like, oh. And then, yeah. And then I'm like, is the Bay Club where you score heroin and hookers? Like, what is this? It feels a bit like it, yes. Right? Okay. So let me yeah. take my teenage boy to the heroin hooker hotel. This is fine. So they're there and they're walking around and they're having like daddy sometime. And Dylan's like, um, that's weird that you left Susan and the baby there. And Gare's like, why? And he's like, cause she, cause the old lady definitely seems like a murderess. And Gare's like, huh, she kind of does, like, doesn't she? Wait, what? <laughs> they could like, be in danger? Shit, I thought this was all about me. Oh yeah, I was like, sir. I was like, pretty sure it sir. is all about me, but maybe they're also in danger <laughs> because of me. Maybe okay. there are other people. I will examine I this further. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know this. I don't believe it, but we'll we'll operate on it until it gets proven wrong. <laughs> you know what? I will accept this hypothesis that perhaps there are other people in the world. I <laughs> let's roll with it. Okay, <laughs> so um, we cut back to the house, and Baby Petey is now the only person who stands in the way of Edie having Susan Alder. Sorry, not Susan Pearl because she's Pearl now. All yeah. herself. So. Edie's like, let's have a martini date. And I was like, oh, okay, what's going to happen? So Edie starts pouring a martini. And like you said earlier, she pulls out a jug of, I think, vodka, because it looks like Smirnoff, but with a label ripped off. Not that I could identify that at 30 paces, mm. based on the shape of the bottle. She takes her giant bottle of Smirnoff. She fills up the martini glasses all the way to the top. She goes and sticks her bare fucking fingers in the olive jar and goes, plink, plink, and drops some olives in both glasses. And then she does like, the funniest, but also the most fucked up. And like, I like martinis, and this would piss me off because this is this is 
not how I like to drink a martini. She takes the vermouth. So she has like the other, there's like two ingredients in a martini. She takes ingredient number two. She somehow like drops some droplets on her fingers and she's like flick, flick over the top of the two martini glasses. And I'm like, so you have two glasses of solid vodka with like the smell of vermouth? Yeah. Yeah. The fuck are you? Like, that's how I know that you were in an asylum. That's going to, like, rip out your insides. Congratulations. Now I know that you're a crazy person. But so she, so Susan was like, I do not want to drink. And Edie's like, what I heard is straight vodka. So she makes the two martinis. She gives it to Susan. And Susan's like, well, you handed it to me. It would be rude not to take it. And they fucking down both glasses. (laughs) And, like, you know, sometimes in a movie when you're drinking clear alcohol, it's clearly, it's just, it's water. Yeah. This the way that the light like plays through it is it has it has like more of a viscosity to it. And like again, I'm hoping that this movie was just really good with props and shit, but the way that it looks when watching it is like Susan and Edie did in fact just fucking down a whole martini glass of solid solid like 3000 proof vodka. And like sure. Fucking is that that's maybe the only way to get through this insane movie is just to be drunk the entire time. And I respect that as um as an acting choice. So good job, props guy, is what I'm gonna say and choose to believe it's not actually vodka. At this point, baby PD starts crying in a far off room and Susan's like, Oh, he's my baby, I need to take care of him. And Edie's like, No, I'm I'm the one who needs to be taken care of. I need all your attention. And Susan's like, Well, this is a baby. So goodbye for a hot minute. And Edie's like, gotta curl the baby. And I was like, oh fucking okay. So um <laughs> Edie is like, oh Susan, like you're you're tired and you've had a long day, and like, why don't you go take a nap? And I will take care of the baby and um then like I'll hang out with him and then we'll make dinner together and then you'll be done with your nap and we'll have more together in his time. And Susan Like, there's, like, red flags. There's, like, guys playing the trombone and screaming the word red flag over and over again and, like, hitting her in the head with, like, smaller red flags. And she's like, okay, I will take a nap. (laughs) Yeah. Like, ma'am, ma'am, the baby (laughs) killed everyone in your entire life and sent them away. Like, Anne tried to fuck your husband with a razor for some reason. Ma'am. So she's like, a nap. Nap sounds good. So she goes into her bedroom um, and she's about to call Gare. And we realize that Edie has unplugged all the phones in the fucking house. Um, Susan is not bothered by this at all. She's like, well. She just wants quality time with me. It's fine. Okay. So Susan is just dumb as a box of rocks. And she gives the baby to um, to Edie. And Edie's like, well, I tried to boil a baby alive once and it didn't quite work. But this is a smaller baby. I bet I could do it this time. So we go to her um, which her bathroom, which I'm calling the Pizza Hut bathroom, because somehow she only has red and white tiles in there. Like it looks and like a you, red you, bathtub. And a red bathtub. Yeah. A it's like red a, bathtub. I don't even remember this being like a nineties color choice. I like it literally is like they got it on clearance from someone who had like made a lot of bad purchasing decisions. Like like a company that yeah. went out of business. Yeah. So it's all it's all like Pizza Hut red themed. Um and Edie is standing next to the bathtub with the water running. And again, I don't know how good special effects were in the 90s, but there is visible steam shooting off of this fucking bathtub. It looks like the hottest bathtub that has ever been a hot bathtub ever. This baby is in danger. Not the baby in the movie, the actor baby. The real baby I am concerned (laughs) about. I don't think Children's Aid was anywhere involved in this movie. And I hope this baby grew up to be okay. But if the baby grew up to be afraid of hot water, like, I think we all know why. So Edie is standing there um, singing Hush Little Baby because she does that the entire movie, sotto voce, in this weird, like, high-pitched this weird high pitched whisper voice, this weird whisper song voice that she like has to like sing everything to. Cause it like the movie couldn't be regular creepy. It had to be extra all the way fucked up, super creepy. Yeah. So, um, okay. So we, we go back and forth between baby PD about to get the baby boiler and, um, Susan being like, I think I'll take a nappy nap and Garrett being like, Wait a minute. <laughs> I think I'm putting the pieces together. So Gare, Gare has now talked to Edie's doctor, who I love that Edie's doctor at first is like, oh, Gare is a fellow physician treating Edie. And then he's like, maybe I should ask if he's a fellow physician treating Edie instead of just fucking assuming it. And then, um, so like for for like doctor-patient privilege, there's an exception if you know that your your patient is going to 
um, hurt somebody. Some like some states also include like if you know they're going to commit a financial crime. But like everyone agrees on if you know they're going to do they're going to like do a murder, <laughs> you can stop the murder. Like that's yeah. like we're all thumbs up. Um, so he sort of doesn't seem aware of that exception. Like he kind of like he he like reveals the information that you would reveal, but like backwards and upside down and sort of like he it's just a weird scene. So um the doctor is like, uh yeah, I gave her the single bottle of lithium. That didn't fix her deep psychosis from 25 years. Oh, that's a <laughs> bummer. I guess I'm not real good at my job. So um he tells Gare that she just got out of the psych ward for 20 um, after 25 years for child endangerment and attempted murder and Gare's like well that seems like a problem so he keeps trying to call the house the first time he calls he gets Edie and she's like Susan's not gonna talk to you anymore she doesn't want to talk to you goodbye Gare bye <sighs> and Gare's like uh oh spaghettios this is good <laughs> so he tries to call back again and Edie at first she just leaves the phone off the hook and then after like after Gare calls the cops and brings um six foot five brick shit house elderly man cop to the door. Um, Edie ends up just like ripping the phone lines right out of the fucking wall. She's like, nope, donezo. So old man cop shows up and he's like, um, Gare's been trying to get a hold of his wife and she's like, she's sleeping. Don't worry about it. And um, brick shit house is like, yeah, I actually, it's totally, it's sort of my job to worry about it. So if you could maybe wake her up because we think that maybe you kidnapped her. And Edie's like, what? That's crazy. Do come in, officer. And I was like, <laughs> sir, shoot her. Sir, I'm not generally on the part of cops, uh, and you shouldn't you, you shouldn't shoot people as like your first line of defense, but fucking shoot her in the face. She's some kind of weird, like, sex demon. Fucking shoot her. Like, just kill, <laughs> kill her. Kill her between the eyes. Use a wooden stake. I don't care. Set her on fire. Like, kill her now. <laughs> Whatever so he's like, it requires. So he he walks into the house. He goes over to the mantle, and there's a picture of Edie and um, Susan and the baby and baby Petey on the mantle. And my first thought was like, how did you have time to make a, like to go to the, to get a picture and then get it developed? Cause you had to get it developed in the nineties and like buy yeah. a frame and then put it on the mantle. And then I remembered, Oh, you've been here for two months. You've two had months. so much fucking time. You live yes. here now. You have so much time to redecorate. So he's looking at it and he's like, huh, that's weird that there's literally no other person in that photograph. That seems like a problem. And <laughs> Edie walks up behind him with a fucking butcher knife and like insta kills him. It is yeah. the funniest thing I've ever seen. Just she walks up right through the back. Yeah. I can't even figure out how this like two foot tall woman managed to put a knife through this guy's shoulder blade who was sick. Like she had to have a like a step stool. She had to be like, one <laughs> second, like, tick -a -tick -a -tick -a, like unfold the step stool and get up on it. She is okay. She is the size of Edna Mode from The Incredibles. She is like one foot five. She is like the yeah. tiniest little, like little, like muffin shaped doll woman. And somehow she managed, like, did she like jump on a trampoline? How did you manage to hit this guy's shoulder blade? He is 900 feet tall. I can't, but she like <laughs> manages to hit his off button basically because he immediately falls face first on the floor and is dead. <laughs> Not, no gasp, no gurgle, no like crawling, no, no calling for help. Out. Done. Yeah, immediately super dead. She insta dig insta kills him. It's like I, I don't know. So she's like, okay, and then she drags his prone corpse across the floor, and I'm like, he is fully like 250 pounds. She weighs as much as a whisper. What the fuck is she on steroids? <laughs> what is going? On? This movie just. This movie was like, what if we start crazy? It's all the lithium, and then. <laughs> she has lithium strength. Is that yes. what you've decided? Yes. You know, you know all those people on lithium who like lift up cars and shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh Powers my beyond this your comprehension. Powered by lithium. Clearly. Yeah, this like the Energizer Bunny. Powered by lithium. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't even. I can't. You know what? Whatever. because you can't fault my logic. I know it is. It is airtight. It is more mm -hmm. airtight than anything in this actual it's movie. So impeccable, impeccable. So she somehow, with her lithium strength, drags this prone corpse of a giant grown man across the floor, and we don't ever see what happens to his body. It's not important. Don't worry about it. Mm. So, so Gare and Dylan can't get. So they called the cop um, when they couldn't get through to the house, but like they haven't heard anything back. They don't know what's going on. So they run down to the dock for the ferry, but I guess the ferry runs like once a day on plot convenience time and it is not plot convenience o'clock. So the ferry has just left. So they're like, ah, oh, shit. No, what are we going to do? 
And they find two guys at the dock who have like two cool dudes in their speedboat. And Gary's like, I got this. So he goes and talks to them like cool bro to cool bro. And they're like, yeah, man, you want to stop a murder? Hop in. So the music the entire movie has been dramatic lifetime movie plus creepy old lady singing. But I guess they had some extra money in their budget. Because at this point, um, it's like Miami Vice. If we're gonna stop a crime, music. <laughs> it's like do 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 do. Yeah, worst. all of a sudden it's like it's like it's like jazzy, <laughs> like jazzy <laughs> like, synthesizer. Like do 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 do. Like is Gary gonna get there or not? I don't know. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I was like, I was like, who's the criminal this week, guys? Like, it's just, I was like, what? What the fucking are? I didn't, I couldn't see the guys in the speedboat. Maybe they are the guys from Miami Vice. Maybe this Maybe. is like a Miami Vice crossover. So they came with their own theme music, which, which was the highlight of this movie for me. So they're, um, they're in the speedboat trying to get to the house, and then. Um, Susan can't get a hold of Gary. She realizes that the phone is dead and is like, maybe, maybe that's a bad sign. So she's like, maybe let me find my baby. So she goes into the bathroom. Um, we've got, we've got Edie with the bunny boiler basically about to happen. And, um, Susan's like, what if I don't let you boil my baby alive? What if I make one decision that is, I don't let someone else make for me? How about that? So she takes the baby. Um, she, ends up trying to leave. So she um, she dr- runs down the stairs. She gets in the car in the garage and she has the garage door like half up. So she <laughs> she's in the car. She's like about to leave and all of a sudden all the lights go out. And so somehow like Edie has like turned off all the power and the garage door isn't going to move at all and whatever. So um, we end up having like a full on Terminator scene where Edie tries to smash her way through all the fucking car windows, which... Sure. Why the fuck not? So yeah. Susan gets so Susan like knocks Edie back against a shelving unit in the garage. Susan hits her fucking or sorry, Edie hits her fucking head, falls face forward on the floor, and I was like, oh, is she dead now and the movie's over? Fuck you. No. No. Any respite you want from this nightmare movie, the movie's like, fuck you, I got 25 more minutes. So <laughs> Susan ends up having this like oh, what's that what's that um that British TV show where there's like the there are people running in and out of doors? Uh, like where they plays yakety sax. Do you know what I'm talking about? I can, can visualize that, but I don't know the name of it. Yeah. So Susan um, and Edie end up having this like yakety sax um, style like chase all around the garage. So uh, all around the property. So Susan rolls herself out from under the garage door with the baby some fucking how. Don't worry about it. Edie somehow manages to get out behind her and they basically run a big circle around the entire property Susan lies in wait for Edie and then handicaps her with a fucking hoe, like breaks her fucking kneecaps and Edie does not die. She barely goes down. And I was like, what? Is it the lithium? Is it her super powered lithium battery that just keeps her going and going? Yes. Yeah. So she, she knocks her over with the, with the hoe, like smashes it into her legs, picks up baby Petey, runs back in the house and you see her, you see Susan lock every fucking door, like in real time. They're like, there's a door here lock how about over here lock what about this door lock every fucking door she locks and then she locks the door to the bedroom puts baby pd on the bed turns around grabs a fucking candlestick out of nowhere and now is like well now that i've locked every door in the house what if i just walk through the house with this upside down candlestick ready to murder someone and i'm like how could they get in but we've established that this movie only makes sense if they're cat people because when she turns around somehow baby pd is not on the bed baby pd is in Grandma Edie's hands, and she's on the bedroom balcony, which we have never established existed before now, but now all of a sudden the bedroom has a balcony. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, the, we just added an addition to the house in the middle of this movie. So I'm like, but you locked all, first off, you broke her legs. She was outside, and then you locked every door. How did she fly up to the fucking balcony? But again, cat people, that's really the only. Yes. Yeah, cat people. So, meow. so she just, you know, climbed up the side of the building. Yeah. Took your baby. <laughs> Oh my god! I this movie only makes sense with cat people or vampires. Like if this were Divya, I'd be like, okay, I get it. But like, yeah, okay. So, um, Susan's like, if you hurt the baby, you hurt a part of me, and you don't want to hurt me, do you? And and Edie has gone like full on around the bend. Gare, um, Gare and Dylan have finally um left the Miami Vice speedboat, and they've run up to the side of the house, and they're like, they're on the lawn staring up at Edie on the balcony with the baby in her hands going full Michael Jackson. 
And they're like, no. Gary does his like patented no scream. And I was like, okay, well, check that off the list of things I like to No. Do. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to do anything. Could you maybe fly up there with your vampire powers or have no. your junior Dylan, have your junior um, boy there fly up with his vampire powers? No, you're just going to stand there and watch this old lady juggle a baby off the side of the building. <laughs> Fucking whatever. <laughs> so Su- Susan's like, um, please don't uh, murder my baby in front of me. That would really bum me out. And Edie, uh, they, they're standing there and they're having an argument and Susan manages to like take the baby out of her hands. And Edie's like, well, I lost my last bargaining chip and I don't want to go back to the insane asylum. So peace out, y'all. And then yeets herself over the balcony, faker than, do you remember at the end of um, the Stranger Than Fiction episode of Forever Night where uh, LaCroix throws a guy off the roof? Oh, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So in that one, you've got, he like picks up something that looks sort of heavy enough to maybe be a body and he throws it off the roof and you don't see the thing fly off the roof. You just see the body on the ground. And in in that case, like it's almost plausible that like you actually saw Nigel Bennett pick up a body and throw a body and the body was on the ground. In this case, they had, they'd used their whole budget up, I guess, to make it look like their, like baby Petey was just about to be murdered uh, 17 times. So they used like they took like a dummy that they got from like behind a magic shop, basically, like just like a piece of shit stuffed with sawdust and asbestos dummy. Yeah. And they, th- they, they, they like, put like a wig on. <laughs> they put like a like a wig on it and they're like, yeah, it's close enough. Yeah. No, and just they go. just throw it <laughs> throw it off the fucking balcony. And it looks like a sack of shit. It is so awful. It is so bad. They're just like <laughs> They're just like, whatever, the movie's over. I don't care. So they toss it and like the way that they toss it is sort of in slow motion and it looks like so they so it looks like Edie has jumped off the balcony and like if you just jumped off the balcony like head first you would land face first on the ground but they like they want this to be artsy as fuck because it's a quality lifetime movie so they have her do like a little somersault like in the air and like you see the body go flippity flip and then land on its back in a bed of roses and i was like the fuck did i just fucking watch so mm, the again the fuck at did this i point, just fucking watch is the subtitle for Gare Gare can can get, get it. it. Yeah. yeah, I know. I there's there's some real good stuff, but it's uh it's possibly outweighed by all of the what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell did I watch? So um again, at this point, canonically, every door in the house and window is locked, but somehow Gare and Dylan are cat people, and like she turns around and they've gone from the front lawn like into the bedroom with her. And I was like, <laughs> fucking how? She just watched she just watched Edie yeet herself off the balcony in this totally locked house. How did you did you vampire fly? Did you yes. did you cat person crawl? Like what? Yes. Doesn't matter. The Both. movie doesn't give a shit. It's over. So cat vampire um, people. Yeah. Um, so we have we have discovered Meg's body outside during the whole chase around the building. Um, I assume at some point we're going to find the dead policeman in the house. Um, no one ever actually seems to put it together that um, that Grandma Verna was killed by this um, doctored insulin, and I guess nobody cares. Um, if that were my situation, I would leave this fucking house and never come back because it's been a scene of two and a half murders. Yeah. But it's a really nice house, you guys. It's It's, it's- very nice and modern for the 90s. She's got some good memories on those stairs. <laughs> Look, he will fuck you up whatever stairs in whatever house you're in. I can guarantee it, okay? It was not the stairs. The magic was inside you the whole time. Yes. Um, so, And by magic, we mean cursed. <laughs> <laughs> it just oh, has the, magic the tattooed code. down the side. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, you want to see some magic? <laughs> <laughs> I got a magic trick to show you. I got a magic <laughs> I'm not cutting this. I'm not ashamed. I'm not cutting any of this. <laughs> Don't, please. <laughs> this is the magic. And by that, I mean real magic, not the magic magic. <laughs> oh, I just started thinking about, you know, like the dancing handkerchief trick. I just, I went somewhere in my head. Okay, yeah. so... <laughs> No hands. I want to see my magic do a disappearing trick. (laughs) (laughs) I I bet I can stab you and it won't hurt. (laughs) (laughs) Is Matt throwing his voice again? Okay, so... (laughs) so I'm so glad he's not here for this. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, anyway, any, anyway, so, 
Um, I feel like anyone else would have left the house at this point, but it's a 90s movie and they wanted to wrap shit up. So we get to like the next day and Susan is in the kitchen making breakfast like nothing the fuck ever happened. And everyone is like, no, they don't have any PTO. They don't have time to take off for this shit. No, no, everyone's like happy and fine and back to normal. And I'm just like, oh, I can we have the sequel to this movie where everyone is like deep in therapy and super <laughs> fucked up about the grandma murders? No, fucking fine. So anyways, so Susan, so everyone's like, everyone's like on the way to work and on the way to school and they kiss her goodbye and whatever, whatever. And then Susan gets a phone call from the Allegra Society. And she's like, I don't, I don't know who the hell you are. What's going on? And the lady on the phone is like, um, your bio dad would actually like to meet you. He's heard that, like, he's found you somehow. And we, our whole society is, um, we're for the purpose of reuniting adoptees and adopt, and a, I don't know, adoptees and their biological parents. Um, would you, would you be interested in meeting with him? And she's like, the fuck no. And they hang up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the end. end. Yeah. And I was like, okay. I, okay. So. The movie, like, starts off with negligent adoptive parents who just lie to their kid for her entire life. And then we we bring up we're so deeply suspicious of adoption as a concept that, like, anyone who gives up a kid must be full-on psycho cuckoo bananas. Um, and not just, like, in a bad situation, but, like, the bad situation was her mental health was zero and she was a murderess who tried to murder her own baby even and like that's why she had to give like even the crazy murderess would not have willingly given up her child is what the movie is straight up saying to us like even someone who has no grasp on reality wouldn't give up their child that's crazy so this child was physically like wrenched from the arms of this cuckoo bananas lady who then gets back into the life of her daughter and proceeds to murder everyone else in her life or scare them away or do yes. her do her best to like I don't know do a fuck dance with a razor to make them go away and then even go so far as to try to boil another fucking baby alive which like you could have you could have picked like a million different ways to be like how do we get rid of the baby without going straight to baby boiler do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, Baby Boiler was a choice. Like, good good job, guys. You went straight to fucking, you need to be in therapy. And then, because she's crazy and it's the 90s, how do we resolve this? Suicide. Right. Ta-da! The end. Like, I just... Wow. So, um, I'm going to give this four raised eyebrows out of five. That many? And... Yeah, no, because we got a lot of characteristics packed into a pretty short, like, he's in it, like, maybe 20%-ish. We open with a kiss. Um, Everybody wants to fuck him, including his wife's estranged bio mom. Uh, He gets spider fingers. He gets head boop. He gets, yeah, he gets most of his characteristics. He gets never nude during a sex Yeah, yeah. Include like you know they were like no man just leave your shirt off and he's like I don't do that and they were like it doesn't make sense for you to put your shirt back on he's like does it make sense for me to wrap up in a sheet and they were like we can't stop you I guess <laughs> so yes meanwhile poor Susan had to be like almost full nude boob like oh for, like God. front and center and screen like they could have they could have um like framed that in some other better way they could have even given her like like a nighty with more coverage and it would have it would have been fine and then she wouldn't have had to like be naked but they had her character be dumb and like why not why not also make her be naked they, like do you know what I mean like just why not yeah. also and they made her they like he even got like the full-on extra over the top I'm making out with this woman like I'm trying to discover something at the back of her of her skull <laughs> uh when when they're going up and down up the stairs and like mashing into every wall like ping pong yes. balls yeah yeah. I okay. So in terms of so I because I um I boxed myself into rating these as like actual movies <laughs> out of 10 <laughs> I don't know like Okay, the gear scenes were so good that they do like I feel like you could make just like just the gear clips and you would have mm. you'd be like this would be good. So I feel like 4.9 maybe. That's I'm good. Gonna yeah, I'm gonna give it a four point nine. Like it's better than Ikway. Okay, that's that's a low bar. That's yeah, it is. I feel but like here we are. The gear scenes. <laughs> I feel like the gear scenes were really, really enjoyable, and like 
they come out of nowhere almost. Like the rest of the movie is just straight up like family melodrama and we're having a problem with kids and we're a blended family and like we're having problems with like with our parents and um we're we're we have like a like a mystery sort of going on and we have it's like a thriller there's like there's like death and violence around every corner and like the one the people that see what's really going on are not believed by everyone around them so like yeah i I feel like you if you had cut this as like an actual mystery it would have been really really good but i still like i don't i don't mind like a thriller but i like that they were like this is like a dumb thriller. How can we spice this up? And Gare's like, ta-da. <laughs> what if? <laughs> they didn't even cast against him. Everyone? He just showed up. <laughs> I think you need a husband for this woman. Yeah. I feel like you need a husband for this character. Here's what I bring to the table. And he just right. like threw her against every wall on the set. And they're like, aha, uh-huh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, we can yeah, use no, that. No, we got it. Yep, okay. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Come on. You can stay. <laughs> we didn't have pictures on the stairwell anyways. Um, so yeah, just go bounce as yeah, much no, as you want Yeah, no, it's cool. Yeah, no. Yeah, so I feel like for... For the Gare scenes and for, I mean, I like that, um, that uh, Ilya, I like that he was in this movie. Yeah. He was such a talented, like, at young actor and he was in, like, so few things. Um, and then he he died, he like, just, I think, one or two years ago. He was 43 and they don't, like, no one will like say what happened. Like 2023. Yeah. Yeah. It was so recent. Um, and I just, I like, I feel bad for his career cut short. So, like, I just... I'm like I'm happy to see him in anything. He's not in this like a whole bunch, but he gets to be the one non dumbass character in the movie. Yeah. So I appreciate I appreciate that. I like any teen vampire vampire dad um, reunion. That's fun for me. <laughs> but yeah, mostly I just I liked Gare um, trying to use his tongue to touch her brain stem as closely yeah. as he possibly could. That was <laughs> that was uh, yeah. I, more of that, please. Thumb, yeah. Thumbs up for that. But like in terms of like, would I watch this movie for fun if it didn't have those um, those sexy scenes, or like just like, would I rewatch this movie like not for the podcast? Like uh, probably not. Probably not, guys. Mm, I don't know. No. 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 Um. Yeah. So it wasn't I, bad. It was a fine. It was fine. It was entertaining. No. I just don't think it'd be entertaining again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, is that a secret characteristic? Fine, but I don't want to watch this again. Oh. No. No, that's not his fault. It's not his. No, it's not his fault. I'm not saying it's his fault. Just we I mean, just well, we've like, gotten a string of them. Like we need a we I need know. a good one next. We need to pick like a. Oh yeah, he's good in that. You know what? He was good in Baxter. That was cute. He just that needed a bigger cute. role. You know, okay, I I vote that we do Murdoch Mysteries next because he is so good in Murdoch Mysteries. Okay. I really like him in Murdoch Mysteries, and and I like Murdoch Mysteries as a show. It's like a fun, inoffensive. Let's solve an old timey murder in like old timey Toronto, and let's all have like weird sideburns and funny accents. Like I just I like it so much. So let's okay, let's do let's that. Try, next let's then. do Murdoch Mysteries for next one. Okay, yeah. So there's Sounds good. there's something there's something good coming down the pipeline. Okay. Okay. I don't remember how we end this. How do we? Until next time, friends. Don't tell him that we exist, please. Yeah, you know the rules. Don't tell anybody. Bye. (laughs) Bye.